welcome to History Hack. If you didn't know by now, we are the revolution. That means we're sharp, witty, lots of fun, but it also means that we're essentially the peasants in Les Mis huddled round a table in the corner of the bar with no money. If you enjoy the show, please do support us. We have a Patreon account by which you can donate a small monthly sum in appreciation of what you're hearing. Alternatively, we have Ko-fi in which you can just do a one-off donation as a thank you if you particularly enjoy a certain episode. Either way, we massively appreciate all of your support. Hope you enjoy the show. Hello and welcome to today's History Hack. I've got Chris with me today. You will not be surprised uh, when you find out what we're talking about that Alina is not with me because she's found something something else to do because that's what she does when we talk about boats. And actually, we, re- like we, we mock it, don't we, Chris? We call them all boats because she doesn't know the difference, but we are actually talking about boats and not ships today. Yep, and, uh, or submarines, which are actually boats, even though some submarines are now bigger than ships. Is so, it hilariously yeah. we now get to add more nuance to the boat versus ship thing with her when she edits this and she's just I can picture her screaming at her. Did she just stop moving the goalposts? <laughs> and the general lack of interest. But this one is gonna be good. This is something that I don't know much about. But it, we've got um Chris O'Flaherty, who is an ex Royal Navy captain and historian who's written about naval mine warfare, politics politics and practices. But he's here today to talk about his two biographies. Torpedoes, Tea and Medals, The Gallant Life of Commander DGH Jake, Jake Wright, DSC, and Crash Start, The Life and Legacy, Lieutenant Richard Guy Ormond Hudson, DSC. Hi, Chris. How are you doing? Hi, great. Thanks very much, Chris. Thanks uh, thanks very much, Alex, for inviting me on. Really looking forward to chatting about them. No, so are we. Like, we were just joking before we came on that the leader was like, ah, it's boats. Chris will know all about it. And Chris was like, yeah, I do cruises, and this Chris doesn't cruises there's a big difference between different types of boats but we're going to get into that and she's going to have to learn because she's editing this episode so i'm i'm muchly impressed with myself for the way this is shaken down uh chris i I want to get into a naval mine warfare with you because i've just been writing about the politics of that as well but we'll do that off air afterwards um subjects of both of these biographies that you've done are yachtsman volunteers can you just can you explain to people what the what the difference is between the Royal Naval Reserve and the Royal Naval Volunteer Reserve and kind of their backstory as to which one they're in and why? Yeah, sure. Well, it's, it, it all boils down to something happened in 1903, which was the thing called the Naval Forces Act. And what this was, was the their lordships were determined to get ready in that case for the First World War, which they could see coming. So what they wanted to do was to formalise um, not just the Royal Navy, which was the regulars, the Royal Naval Reserve, which was effectively the merchant sailors um, who'd all signed up to say they would serve for the Navy in war. And you also had a thing called the Royal Fleet Reserve, which is everyone that's finished their naval service and they become a civilian, but they can be called back again. And what they wanted to do was to move on from something which was the Royal Naval Artillery Volunteers, and they called it the Royal Naval Volunteer Reserve. And it was a fantastic thing that came about. And um, the Act actually specifically said that officers in command of divisions and companies when recruiting for the Royal Naval Volunteer Reserve to bear in mind the special qualifications which will best suit volunteers for His Majesty's service. Every recruit must possess physical fitness, intelligence and a desire for sea service. Men with the habit of the sea are particularly desired. And why that's important was because yachties signed up. Well, this is it, isn't it? This is this is now finding a loophole to also recruit any of these guys that spends their weekend sailing, uh, likes being out on the water, and has skills that the naval might that the that the navy might be able to use. Exactly that, and this was basically broadening it from the people that could operate the big ships. You were talking earlier on about ship versus boat. And yes. this was broadening the recruiting base right down to the people that just went sailing at the weekends. Yeah. And the reason they're all known as yachtsmen volunteers is the vast majority were actually sailors. That's I think how they got their habit of the sea. We have to understand the nuances of different types of ships, don't we? Both Chris's. I mean, like, I just sent Chris a draft of something I'm writing. And you think like, oh, yeah, we've commandeered a 19,000 ton ocean liner, uh, Coronia, and she's now in the Royal Navy. We're sending you a captain. That captain arrives and his his maximum size ship he's ever dealt with at that point is 3,000 tons. So he yeah. says, uh, please, could I keep the captain and, and the officer, the deck officers um, from Cunard on this ship? Because I don't know how to manoeuvre her. 
Exactly. And so what you basically got a situation where um, the officer corps in the Royal Navy Volunteer Reserve was basically drawn from people with Board of Trade Yacht Master tickets. Um, but very quickly, and certainly by the time the Second World War came about, um, a lot of the people with Yacht Master tickets were funneled through very quickly. And they were going through a training course of only 10 days to take them from effectively being um, civilians to being useful on the small ships of the Navy. Um, an interesting, nice little throwaway line on that is that the uh, the answer for why the course was 10 days was that was how long it took the tailors down in uh, HMS King Alfred to make their uniforms. It actually had nothing <laughs> to do with the training. Well, um, this is really interesting. So the merchant officer that I've been researching, he had, so he's RNR. So right. he's had 13 months. He's gone off from his day job and spent a year with the Navy to train to get ready for his role. Is there a snobbery to this hierarchy? Do, do the oh. RNR people look down on the RNBR people? Oh, they are. I mean, bearing in mind that the um, the acronym works at the time, the Royal Naval Volunteer Reserve were all called Saturday Afternoon Sailors. Um, so don't break that down into its acronym because, of course, the SAS didn't exist at the time. <laughs> but they were really looked down on. And certainly for the first two years of the war, uh, I would say that the regular RN service just treated these people as kind of just supernumeraries. But as we'll talk, probably talk about as we go through now, by the time the war ends, the vast majority of coastal forces personnel have actually come from the Royal Naval Volunteer Reserve. And one of the benefits they brought to this was a completely different way of operating. They weren't constrained by the doctrinal thinking and the training which had kind of made, molded the minds of a naval officer. They just came in from their civilian trades. I mean, well, you what, get what boys place... own, don't you? That kind oh, of attitude absolutely. to it. And more importantly, when you talk about boys own, I don't think they properly understood fear and risk. And therefore, when you see vessels under RNVR command going into combat, they are taking some amazing risks that I think regular naval officers would have thought twice about. It's like a whole concept of them being on a jolly, isn't it? Oh, yes. Oh, this was a <laughs> jolly. For many so... of them, it was. And they were demobilised very quickly. And when you look at their backstories for after the war, um, a lot of them kept going on it. Um, the uh, the Naval Club in London actually was founded by Royal Navy Volunteer Reserve in order to keep the camaraderie that they've developed. Brilliant. So right, we completely rabbit holed already onto the structure of the Royal Navy, but that's, that's just how we roll. And Alina should have expected it because it's me and Chris. Uh, so yeah. the two the two chaps, your two yachtsmen volunteers, tell us about them. Yeah, so um, the first one was um, a guy called uh, Guy Hudson, um, who got a Distinguished Service Cross for his actions at Dunkirk. And um, he was a trainee solicitor before the war. He was at Oxford University when war broke out, and he wanted to serve his country. So he went off, joined the Royal Navy Volunteer Reserve. He did six months as a rating before his officer training. And then he served in most torpedo boats, initially um, in the Mediterranean, but then came back to UK. Um, the real story, though, with um, uh, with Guy Hudson is that he saw some pretty horrific things during the war, and we can talk about that if you want. And so he ended up with what you and I would now think of as PTSD, um, became an alcoholic, but he also made an absolute fortune. And uh, and I can talk at the very end about why I have an interest in him, um, but he left a lot of his money to enable charity, which is absolutely amazing. Um, the second bloke, Jake Wright, uh, was the first commanding officer of a most torpedo boat that's now in the in the Royal Museum of the Royal Navy. And he was a tea trader before the war, um, joined up, um, again, did a short period as a rating before his officer training. And the difference with him is that he was a tactical maestro. He was an absolute thinker, went into battle many times, three distinguished service crosses and a mention in dispatches. And then after the war, he went off and became the director of global tea purchasing for Brooke Bond. So if either of you are sitting there um, as part of this chat with a cup of tea on your desk, um, on a balance of probabilities, you may actually be drinking a cup of tea that's formulated um, based on uh, a bit of work that Jake Wright did and how to make the perfect cup of tea. But we can talk about that later as well. I don't think there's a solution to that question, is there? Is there a perfect way to make a cup of tea? <laughs> My mum always tell me, tells me I have too much sugar. But, <laughs> but uh, both, the, both the biographies are about uh, motor torpedo boats. Um, yeah. I mean, we've got one at Chatham Dockyard and she's fairly small. So what makes them so special? I mean, like I said, uh, I, I'm into fast cruisers and bigger guns, but 
NTBs are really quite important. They are. Well, this, the history of small torpedo boats in the Navy is quite checkered, actually. It started realistically in 1916 with a guy called Geoffrey Hampton, and interestingly, a probationary surgeon officer, Eric Hansen, um, put a proposal to the Admiralty for a thing called a coastal motorboat. And this was a 40 foot boat which could be launched from a cruiser. It would have a single torpedo um, basically mounted on the transom and they could drive it into enemy harbours or right up to the enemy to get the torpedoes really close to um, what was the German fleet at the time. Bearing in mind, of course, torpedoes at that time had a range of about 700 to 1,000 yards, which is too close for things like cruisers, destroyers uh, and battleships to get. The problem was being small, they're sea state limited and range limited. Um, but the idea caught on, a bit of limited use in the war, but in August 1919, um, there was an attack on Kronstadt uh, in Russia where coastal motorboats sank a battleship and a depot ship. And as a result, they got some serious attention for a few years. But then the Navy um, decided that, yeah, actually, they're a bit small. We like big ships driving around. So by 1939, you had only 22 motor torpedo boats in the entire Royal Navy, of which 12 were in Malta. So they got those back to the UK. So they realised they needed small boats to protect the coast. They could go out. They could stop the e-boats attacking our convoys. Um, and I'm going to be very controversial here because being small, about 40 tonnes, being small, about 60 to 80 feet, and only having a ship's company of about 11 to 13 people, the fact was that they were sacrificial. You could put them into really dangerous situations. And if you lost one or two, those losses are acceptable. But if you arm them heavily, they can strike hard and they can strike quick. And we went into serious mass production. A lot of gun actions where they drove up close to the enemy and that led to the birth of the motor gunboat. A lot of torpedo actions, which led to um, 1,169 torpedoes being fired by motor wow. torpedo boats during the war, of which 301 were hits. And interestingly, that ratio of torpedo hits is better than that seen by submarines. Um, and by the peak of the war in early 1944, there were 237 motor torpedo boats and 58 motor gun boats in service. Um, and these guys were brave. They earned two VCs, 19 distinguished service orders and 350 distinguished service crosses between them. They are just absolutely amazing because that's it. They quick, strike hard and they can be sacrificial. Yeah, because um, I, I know from sort of before the First World War, they were when Whitehead's torpedo came out, everyone was like, oh, my God, these are fantastic. We can take down a multi pound battleship with a small boat. And um, I know with the Königsberg in the Refugi, they actually put a couple of torpedoes on a small launch and sent that up the river to try and get her. So, um, What's yeah, hilarious, they're... though, is like, do you, have you seen like U9? Uh, you must have done because you gave it to me, that account of the guy firing the torpedoes at Hogue, Abaca and Cressy. They had yeah. no idea what the effect was going to be. They, they, did, they thought there was a possibility when they shot first, at Hogue first, isn't it, that the concussion might kill them all in their submarine. They had no idea of like the physics in at play and whether or not they were actually committing suicide. Yeah. yeah. The, the, the big thing with torpedoes is you're putting a big warhead directly underneath um, the enemy. So instead of when you're firing a six pound shell, you know, six pound a gun, I mean, people forget six pound is the weight of the shell and six pound is not much. It's you know, two and three quarter kilos. Whereas a typical torpedo, you're putting a 700 kilograms of high explosive directly underneath the enemy. That's enough in one shot to kill the enemy and to destroy the vessel. So they're brilliant. Yeah, makes the MTB so so vital. Yeah. Um, so let, let's look at the, at the first one. Jake Wright, he's uh, the most decorated of your two subjects. Uh, he gets the Distinguished Service Cross three times. Can you yeah. describe uh, one of his actions? Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, the, one, the one I'll pick briefly is um, there's a great action on 29th of July 1942. And Jake Wright was part of the fourth most torpedo boat flotilla based in Felixstowe. And they would got some uh, intelligence that there was going to be some German convoys off the Dutch coast. So they combined um, two most torpedo boats with three motor gunboats. And they sailed across the North Sea, um, having sailed at nine o'clock in the evening. And what they decided was that if they came across an enemy, then the motor gunboats would peel off to one side of the battlefield and they would cause a distraction. 
whilst the most torpedo boats would get themselves into a firing position about 800 yards from the enemy, nice and quietly. And then whilst the motor gunboats are distracting the enemy on one side, the most torpedo boats are going to attack from the opposite. And and they did it. They they just started slowing down at midnight 37 uh, on the 29th of July. And as they slowed down, they were just giving the relevant orders uh, when suddenly they noticed um, three Germans just up ahead of them. And so instantly and without any orders being given, um, the motor gunboats accelerated up to uh, 30 knots. They came into line ahead and they just screamed at 30, 35 knots directly across the bow of the enemy and just basically opened up a gun action. Meanwhile, the two motor torpedo boats peeled gently off to port and started lining themselves up um, for a, a torpedo attack. And I'll, I'll, if I may, I'll just quote briefly from, from the biography, because this describes it rather well. And through the blinking muzzle flashes of the gun battle, Jake could make out three enemy ships. Two armed trawlers were escorting a cargo ship of about a thousand tons. The cargo ship was centre of the three, and her superstructure was picked out by some reflected moonlight. Jake shut down his throbbing main engines, hoping to remain undetected for a few extra seconds. And with a concentration of men facing down their maker, Jake and his Cox and Reggie Walker used the near silent auxiliary engine to keep their bow pointing just ahead of their target. With a distracting gun battle raging opposite, Fryer in most torpedo boat 69 discharged his first weapon, a single torpedo from his starboard tube, and stopwatches were clicked in expectation of a 35 second torpedo run. But no one saw the second hand rotate that far. The enemy had heard them and seen them and instantly realised where the true threat to their survival lay as Jake became the target. He shouted fire port just as MTV-32 was hit by an explosive shell. So basically, they're in the battle now. He's fired his torpedoes, but he's taking fire. Three more enemy shells hit most torpedo boat 32. And with the calmness of an officer wholly in control of his destiny, though, Jake orders crash start the direction for his engine room team to bring all main engines online now. He continued taking hits, and basically the battle rolls out where they can see the motor gunboat battle raging opposite. They can feel the explosion of the first torpedo hit the enemy um, cargo vessel. But motor gunboat um, 67, which is the leader, then thinks, hang about, there's three vessels here. We've hit one. Let's have a go at another. And so what then happens is Jake, he's taking hits, but he can see MGB-67, this guy called Guy Bossart, turn in and flash one long red flash on his signal lantern, which means I'm attacking with depth charges. And Bossart then screams across the bow of the enemy trawler at a range of 30 yards. Bear in mind, the enemy trawler is shooting, and he's going at 35 knots across the bow at 30 yards range. And he rolls his depth charge gently over the side as the trawler drives forward over the depth charge, which is sinking. And the depth charge then explodes and lifts up the bow of the trawler, just literally snapping it in half. Um, wow. It's just, you know, and then Jake Wright then you know, peels off along with uh, Morris Pryor in 69. And just as they're peeling off, they can see some enemy e-boats coming the other way because they've seen what's going on. Um, and so Jake Wright thinks, right, let's just get out of here. He's got three engines and two Cs because they've actually taken so much damage in the engine room that all the cooling systems are completely shot through. And so a guy called Ernest Rowe, who's his um, engine room artificer, basically restarts um, two of the engines. Um, sorry, restarts one of the engines and then runs a hose from the fresh water tank to start cooling the engine so they can literally get the hell out of there. I mean, wow. this is one of the actions. That's really quite impressive. <laughs> this, if you go back to what I said, I mean, the thing with motor torpedo boats what, and motor gunboats, what makes them special? They're sacrificial. These guys, they were regularly coming back alongside in Felixstowe, in Lowestoft, in Harwich. And they were discharging their wounded. They were discharging dead. Um, and then the following day, just getting back on board and going out and doing it again. It just, I know Chris is now completely hooked and excited. And this is now his new obsession, isn't it, Chris? Yeah, this will be a rabbit hole I'm diving down. Or yeah. <laughs> I am not asked though. So they are tiny. Like you've given the measurements and the weight out. Um, 
do they live on them all the time? What's life? Uh, is, is it a case of as well? I'm guessing like fuel and stuff. Do they go out and come back every day? Do they live on board? Do they have to live somewhere else? You talked about coming back because obviously there's nowhere to store or treat the wounded, mm. like on a bigger ship. There's no like hospital bay. There's no place to store the dead. So they constantly coming and going. Yeah, basically the the, the drill was. I mean, they're, they're small. They're they're nimble. They're light. They're made of wood. Don't forget, vast majority of them. Um, and you mentioned fuel. I mean, ten percent of the entire volume of the vessel is taken up by fuel, because you know these engines are absolutely drinking petrol, and the fuel they are using in the British boats is petrol. This is highly volatile fuel. But we didn't have the diesel engine industry which Germany had. German boats ran on diesel, less flammable. We ran on petrol, highly flammable. Um, and 45% of the innards of the boat as well is machinery. It's three massive main engines, typically, in a most torpedo boat. So to answer your question, they mainly lived ashore. Um, certain ports they didn't. When they were, for example, in Foy, down in uh, Cornwall, um, there was no shore accommodation, so they had to live on board. Is this um, less but... space to live in than a submarine? Oh, God, yeah. It's, yeah. you know, it's it's Because absolutely... I think people can equate in their imaginations that living on a submarine is is hideous. So it's yeah. even worse than that. It's You'd even be... worse than that. There's one small paraffin stove. Um, there are two toilets um, in a typical most torpedo boat for the 13 of them. Um, I'll be quite blunt, one for the officers and one for the ratings, but I think they mixed and matched. Um, the ratings, there was one big mess deck forward, which was eating, sleeping, socialising cooking it was just one big room effectively and when i say big i'm not talking very much at all it's only about 20 22 feet long um the food was extremely basic on board because it's pretty battered about whenever they're at sea but to answer your second question did they come and go the answer is yes every the, most torpedo boats typically will go to sea um for a patrol overnight they had a range of about 500 miles which they could quite easily cover in about 12 hours and they will come back, refuel, rearm, go ashore, sleep, because you couldn't sleep when the vessel was pounding over the seas, and then go back out again. Um, the one respite they had was rum. And, and of course, the rum ration used to take place in mid-morning. So if you were at sea on a daylight patrol, which is unusual, you would get a rum ration. But if you're at sea overnight, you wouldn't. That's that sad. Did, unless, <laughs> very, very tragically, an enemy bullet had come through the side of your boat and had snapped the top of the glass bottle off. And it was amazing reading some of the records of how many bottles of rum very conveniently had the next. Oh, that off accidental, accidental damage. So we had to drink it before and it they all had to fell drink out it on the way back. Good man. They could always break the rum out for medical reasons. And that was one of the reasons it was carried. But it is absolutely incredible. The, um, the coxswains and their imaginative accounting. <laughs> uh, as as they did all of that, but it is amazing. Life on board was very cramped. Yes, it's like when we do uh, tours of of the ocelot, and uh, you have ex ex submariners come on and go, "Oh, we hid beer in here. Oh, and in here, and that torpedo tube that was full of beer." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> never underestimate how the Royal Navy can get hold of a drink. <laughs> <laughs> never, never under underestimate the ingenuity of a sailor. <laughs> I just quickly flashing back you just said 500 miles in 12 hours so these little things can go the length of Great Britain in 12 hours basically basically if they wanted to yes um their, their typical range is about 500 miles their typical speed certainly for the um 72 foot most torpedo boats was up to 40 knots with a sustained speed of about 30 between 32 and 35 knots um, when they were transiting over to the other side of the North Sea, they would norm their transit speed was 25 knots. So that and you know that they can they can really shift. I mean that is 100 miles every four hours if they want to do that. Um, but what the commanding officers were juggling was speed versus fuel consumption, because you only had a finite amount of fuel on board, typically about 500 gallons. This is starting to sound like fun though. Fast boat all crammed into one room together, broken rum bottles, cavalier attitude to Royal Navy discipline. Um, it's, it's sounding like a fun war in, in it was. relative terms. It was an amazing fun war, but as as Guy Hudson, and we'll probably talk about this later on, is you, know, you see some things which yeah. in your civilian career you could never imagine. Um, mm. And those do have effects on people, unfortunately. Well, before we get to that, we, we've mentioned sort of like 
the chaos of battle and some of the early tactics but with with everything else during wartime uh, the tactics change can you sort of walk us through the the key tactical developments and and how this affected uh, affected the guys on the ground yeah sure it's well i mentioned earlier on i mean most torpedo boats didn't really see much favor in the interwar period because we were down to only 22 boats 12 i say 12 in malta and as a result the um tactical doctrine for motor torpedo boat work by 1939 was almost non-existent. It was um, a group of, it was regulars in the initial stages um, that would drive around the Mediterranean, literally having a bit of fun with their high-powered vessels. And when they were called back to the UK in 1930, November 1939, um, they were just told kind of go on patrol. Um, and the patrols were principally defensive. They operated in packs. Um, they were never really getting into torpedo range because the enemy weren't sending their big cargo vessels over to our side of the North Sea. And they were very sea state limited. So as people came in with a different mindset, and principally this was the Royal Navy Volunteer Reserve, the Yachtsman Volunteers, they wanted to see action. They wanted to get more aggressive. So they started doing some intelligence-led offense. And that was where they evolved the tactic of the motor gunboat firing its guns for distraction, and the motor torpedo boats being a bit more silent going in for the strike. And that started working quite well, with motor gunboats principally taking on the E-boats, motor torpedo boats taking on the bigger German cargo vessels. But every now and again, the motor gunboats would come across a cargo vessel that, of course, their guns couldn't deal with. So there was a lot of frustration. And in 1942, they merged or a decision was taken to merge motor gunboats and motor torpedo boats and basically put a bigger gun on the torpedo boats and put torpedo tubes on the gunboats. Um, and that also led to a big debate about do you fire all your torpedoes at once? Do you go in as two or three vessels and fire one after the other? Um, by the end of the war, the answer was volley fire, basically everybody together. But it took a long time to work out that was the best way of doing it. And part of that was coordinated by the evolution of radio, because in the early stages of the war, it was all watching your mate. It was all you know, like in a rugby team where you've got to try and think where your other players are through instinct. Whereas with the radio, you can actually start developing those tactics much better. And most of the radio fits happened in late 42, early 43. Um, and that led to a much more aggressive stance by their lordships who started sending most torpedo boats over to the german side much more frequently and a rather interesting battle that never was um and this battle principally played out in the pacific but also in the north sea where um the japanese at the end of second world war um, were asked what they thought of the um the american uh, patrol torpedo boats and the americans had dismissed them they they said they'd not struck with enough torpedoes they weren't in action often enough and at the end of the war the americans have basically burnt most of them as useless the japanese said no no no, they're not useless the reason you didn't fire many torpedoes is as soon as we heard a torpedo boat was out we stayed in harbor we were absolutely scared witless of torpedo boats and so the battles never occurred simply because you had torpedo boats present and that led to much more torpedo boat activity even in the uk as we were learning this lesson in the north sea we then got what's known as a CCR torpedo, which is a, um, a, um, a coil rod torpedo with a magnetic fuse. Better, because instead of exploding or hitting the enemy, it could explode underneath it and break its back. And the big one in terms of tactics, your question, was radar. Um, early part of the war, it was all visual. By 1942, you had very basic radar on some of the motor torpedo boats. And by 1944, you have plan position indicators, which were the big you know, round radar screens we're all used to today. And from that, it was Guy Hudson, actually, who developed tactics of vectoring most torpedo boats who couldn't even see or hear their enemy. But same as you vector a fighter, you vector a most torpedo boat. And actually, one of the trials, um, the most torpedo boat actually hit their target because the radar vectoring was so good, they actually rammed it before they saw it. Um, which was quite a um, an expensive mistake to make, but radar made a massive difference. Um, and by the end of the war, they were even firing on radar data alone. Wow, um, that's amazing. This is another one of my rabbit holes. I'm, I'm quite into Bristol Beauforts and um, torpedo bombers. Was there much competition between the MTB arm and the and the and coastal command torpedo bombers? 
seeing oh, as yes. they're doing the same job. <laughs> they were doing a similar job, but it was there, there was cooperation, um, and particularly because a lot of the coastal command um, fighters and bombers were based over in Lincolnshire and the East Coast. They actually talked quite a lot to each other, and in Felixstowe in particular, um, there was some shared accommodation there because the base in Felixstowe um, was originally a um, an RAF base, and the base in Harwich. When they moved down to uh, to Harwich, they actually shared accommodation with the local uh, balloonatics, which is the balloon the balloon corps. I'm not sure of the exact RAF phrase. I know it's not Women's Auxiliary Balloon Corps from Blackadder. <laughs> Um, but I know that there were balloonatics uh, in that vicinity. Um, but in terms of rivalry, where the principal rivalry came was actually in torpedo supply, because the RAF needed 18-inch torpedoes to drop from uh, coastal command vessels, although it's mainly fleet air arm that did that. Um, and by 1942, torpedoes were in really short supply, actually, and you saw most torpedo boat tactics, specifically how many patrols they could do, were being limited by the supply of weapons. Wow. Let's talk about, so you've mentioned this a couple of times now, and I want to go back and touch on it because we are having like, we're having a laugh with like what a jolly lark all of this is and that, but what the things that they saw and how it affected them um, really comes into play with your other subject, uh, Guy. So can you talk to us about kind of what happened to his mental health as a result of all this nuttiness? Yeah, sure. It's um, it's it's a very really interesting story because Guy was just a university student at the start of the war. Um, called up, his first ship was a ship called HMS Seek, a uh, tribal class destroyer. And um, whilst they were on convoy protection duty, they were diverted to go um, as part of the chase of the Bismarck. And as HMS Seek was tracking the Bismarck, she'd been moved maneuvered into position by um, HMS Suffolk as one of the tracking screen. Um, they had a man overboard. And the weather, for those that are historians of the uh, of the Bismarck chase, you'll know the weather was pretty awful. Seek turned around. Um, they got within 15 yards of the man. And bearing in mind that Guy Hudson was a coder, um, he was on the bridge wing watching, you know, just trying to get his shipmate back on board. Guy 15 yards away, um, and that's the moment he slipped below the waves. So um, as a young 20-year-old, Guy saw one of his shipmates drown, quite literally. Um, then during the sinking of Bismarck itself, and again, for the historians of that particular battle, they'll know that Bismarck was sunk with over 2,000 sailors on board, many of whom got off. But after um, H.S. Marlborough and a few others, Mashona had recovered only about 60 of the Germans. Um, some intelligence and a smoke sighting um, led to the conclusion that there was a German U-boat in the area. And so orders were given to cease recovering survivors. And Seek did steam through a group of Germans that were literally screaming to be rescued. And the orders were don't. And it, it wasn't out of malice or anything else. It was they were in anti-torpedo or anti-submarine mode and they could not risk slowing down. So, again, as a young, able seaman, those are the kind of things which you're exposing young 20 year olds to. Um, but coastal forces were notorious for their socializing guy already drank quite a lot he had a little thing called a hudson heart starter which was his bespoke drink uh, as a rather strong gin and tonic version but he started taking to that particularly after hms seek was sunk in uh, as part of operation agreement off to brook because he was supposed to be part of that raid protecting seek but his torpedo boat was um, was defective on that evening so couldn't sail. Uh, and he knew 115 of his shipmates had just died. Um, then off of Tunisia, he repeatedly saw his boat and other boats go out, engage the Germans, engage the Italians, and come back and discharge dead. And the number of funerals he attended was absolutely huge. Um, and eventually the drinking got the better of him. And whilst he was in Malta, um, he was he was drunk and he tripped over a carpet and he put his hand out uh, to use a glass table to break his fall. Unfortunately, the glass table broke and a shard of glass went through his hand, which uh, meant that he was um, hospitalised back in the UK. But after the war, he continued to drink very heavily. And all the research I have suggests that a lot of it were down to the memories um, from his wartime service of seeing people... Um, badly injured and uh, he ended up on um, eventually he got drunk on his 25th wedding anniversary his wife divorced him but his second wife persuaded him to go to the doctor and you may have heard of a drug called antabuse which if you take it every day 
if you've taken antibuse and you then drink alcohol, you'll throw up very violently. And that prevented him drinking for nearly 20 years as part of his second marriage, which is an incredibly happy marriage. But when his second wife passed away, unfortunately, he stopped taking the drugs. He used to collect it every week. He would go to the doctor and collect his new supply of antibuse. Um, but when he died, his uh, his niece, who went to clear out his house, went into the shed and found about four months worth of alcohol, bottles, wine and various other things that he'd been hiding from people, along with his supply of antibuse, which he stopped taking. Um, very tragic. Basically, reading through it, I talked to some medical friends. They said the guy had PTSD pretty badly. Yeah, that's one of the things that... Um a lot of people think naval warfare can be quite sterile because you're just shooting at ships and it's all great until it's not and it all goes wrong and uh, the even just someone going overboard it's just death and destruction is horrific of all ship and when it goes wrong compared to on land your escape routes are absolutely non-existent aren't they you're stuck there to witness everything experience everything Exactly. And that's and I think that's exactly what um, I mean, bearing in mind Guy Hudson's training, he's because he was already he'd been in the officer training corps before the war. He'd only done three weeks of basic training um, on joining up formally. And I think the consequence of that, and I go back to my own training, you you spend 16 months as I did at Dartmouth and you get imbued into this kind of way of thinking, this camaraderie, the, and I'll be quite blunt, the black humour that comes along with military service. But if you've not been absorbed properly into that black humour before it happens to you for the first time, then you can see people affected by it. Moving on, we've got Jack Wright. And like you said earlier, he has quite a, a brilliant career in the, in the tea trade. Uh, yeah. So how did he use his sort of naval training to uh, to help him with that? Um, he was an amazing bloke, actually. His, um, he, when, he, when he left the Navy after the Second World War, um, he went back to Brook Bond, who sent him out initially to India and then to Ceylon, which is now Sri Lanka. Um, but he took with him a lot of naval mannerisms. He was um, he was Jack in modern parlance. He absolutely had an anchor tattoo through his soul. Um, and so his nickname became the Admiral. Um, and what he did is his stance, his demeanour, his presence um, was very military, his leadership style and most importantly, the way he looked after his, his people. As part of Brooke Bond um, out in Colombo, um, there was a thing called the Hartle, which was the big civil unrest in August 1953, when the Lankasama Jamaja Party were promoting a lot of working class concerns for social justice. And what Jake White had done is he'd mentored his local employees to be good employees of Brooke Bond, but then worked out, well, actually, I need to protect these people from what's going on. And he really took it upon himself, almost like a ship's company, to change their accommodation, to make sure they had food, to make sure they had access to electricity, to make sure that they were looked after and therefore they would stay loyal to Brook Bond. And he moved a lot of them up to Trincomalee, up in the north of Colombo. So when Colombo became untenable as a naval port, um, he ended up actually um, having moved a lot of his staff to safety because he loved his staff. Um, he then opened Trincomalee as an export port for tea. And he used all of his naval knowledge to negotiate with the Trincomalee Harbour Authority and the Steve Dawes, the Wharf, Wharfmongers, all of the other key players to get um, by the 8th of August 1958, the SS uh, Chukdina to sail with 750 tonnes of tea out of Trincomalee. And that was the complete change in export policy out of Sri Lanka. And all of that came down to his naval expertise, his understanding of the sea of shipping. And most importantly, I think his nurturing and his leadership of his people, of his workers, who for him were just part of his ship's company, who he known and loved. And then when he later joined the Tea Council, um, he looked at problems differently. Tea was in decline as a drink after the Second World War, and he wanted to help arrest that. Um, and so I think he was one of those that came up with a slogan of join the tea set, which is a big advertising slogan to try and restore tea consumption in the UK. Um, but I think most importantly, he was very good at codifying stuff. He, as a tactician in the Second World War, he was fastidious in writing down the details of his battle engagements. And that was great for me as a researcher researching the book. 
But you asked about how he used his naval training in the tea trade. And I said there's going to be some controversy in this um, in this podcast. And it comes now. It's called um, ISO, the International Standard 3103 of 1980. And this was drafted by Jake Wright um, as part of his work with um, the International Standards Organization. And it's how to make the perfect cup of tea. Jake wrote it down because he was a tea taster. And it's very clear. The milk is added to the cup before the tea is poured into the cup. Oh, no, Not we're going to have debate. outrage it's now, there. aren't we? I That's agree it. with that. I that, is, that, is the, uh, that is the controversy for this podcast. Milk before the infused tea. Oh, why don't you just chuck in the scone thing with the whether you put the cream or the jam on? Why don't we just have a complete implosion? Jam first and the cream. <laughs> well, the well, thing is, scones, scones is not even worthy of a debate. It's cream before jam all the time. So I'm from Devon. Oh. Uh, oh, yeah. Sorry, Chris Sams, you're outnumbered. Why, why <laughs> do you not put, why would you put the topping on first, you weirdo? Because it, it adheres the cream to the scone. <laughs> Oh my god! There is no. This is why you're single. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's blame that. <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna stay well out of that one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, and I have to ask: Were there any? So as so, you've served yourself, like you say, you've got a certain kind of empathy with with their training and how they operate and how they think. Did you find any surprises about either of these men when you were researching them, other than the 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 absolute car crash of putting the milk in the teacup first um well beyond, beyond the milk and the tea um the probably the key thing is, is is when you're doing a research for a biography is you've got to look at the people it, it is obviously all about the people and you say that you know i'm a sailor i'm used to my sailors I mean, sailors are amazing people they'll they, you know they're amazing because they'll fix the unfixable they'll mend the unmendable they'll solve the unsolvable and they're also amazing quite often with their stories because, you know, very often a sailor will stand in front of you on a Tuesday morning with his cap on and say, sir, you're never going to believe this, but, and it's their <laughs> excuse, whatever. And that normally involves a member of the opposite sex. Yeah. I think the surprise is with both of these people, they, they you, prima facie, you think they're living absolutely fantastic lives. But in the case of Jake Wright, um, the big surprise that came up was when he was out in Colombo um, after as part of the tea trade. Um, there was an element where um, the a documentary maker, a guy, a girl called um, Jacqueline Charlotte Sharrett Lobwich, um, went to Colombo to make a documentary about um, about tea growing, and she was introduced to Jake Wright. And unfortunately, it happened just as Jake's wife was about to take passage back to the UK for a holiday to come and see her family. And a lot of rumours started circulating um, around Colombo society about Jake's friendship with Jacqueline. And when I wrote this in the biography, all four of my peer reviewers circled it in red. Chris, does this really need to be in here? And then they get to the bit just after his wife passed away. And 14 months later, um, he marries Jacqueline. And they all kind of go back and you can see on the scripts that they had annotated. I now understand why it needs to be here because he maintained his friendship with Jacqueline. Um, but Jacqueline was quite an interesting character because um, she was a filmmaker. And if I gave you the name of a few of her films, you may guess the other type of film she was involved with. One was called Keeping It Up Downstairs. Another one was called The Ups and Downs of a Handyman. <laughs> And this is this is Chris's wheelhouse, not mine. <laughs> oh right. So basically, um, Jacobin was involved in the soft porn industry uh, for many years, and so in terms of research surprises, that was one I don't think I'd ever expected to come across. Um, and almost kind of continuing the theme um, with um, Guy Hudson, when one of the key things that you can get a lot of information from as a as a biogra biographical researcher is a will. And Guy Hudson, he uh, he made a will with Pat, his wife, and they're what's called mirror wills. So basically, both parties have a very similar will, and um, they both signed the wills on a particular day, and um, they you know did that with the solicitors. But one of the things you can do in law is you can have a thing called a codicil to a will. So you don't change the main will. It's normally done if you want to give a particular object, a car, a caravan, or a boat to somebody later. So you don't change the main will. You just sign a codicil. And Guy had a codicil to his will, signed on the same day as his will, leaving almost everything to Pat, and signed in the same pen, witnessed by the same people in the same room. 
which left £10,000 to a young lady who worked at the local Marks and Spencers. And, and again, you kind of trying to work this one out because the Code of Seals specifically says this is a purely friendship and plutonic relationship. You're thinking, why would you even write that? So in terms of research surprises, say the key ones that struck out for me is, um, is the backstories of the people. And when you talk to the families about it, I'll be quite frank, or in both cases, uh, from my biographies, the family were brilliant, very helpful in both both instances. Um, but those are the kind of surprises you get. I never never thought I'd come across a, um, a, porn, a porn filmmaker. <laughs> I, mean, I, I just want to put, put in that I, I don't have in-depth knowledge on that subject. <laughs> Neither do I. <laughs> I don't think anyone does. Um, but so, but quickly saving, bearing, getting myself out of this. Uh, the royalties for both your books um, are being paid to charities. Um, I love know. that. Chris is like, let's get away from porn quickly before I get myself into trouble. Talk to me about charity instead. It's, uh, I'm more into charity than into that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> just to restart that. Um, so uh, yeah, both 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 books royalties are going into into charity. Um, do you want to tell us a bit about which charities and why? If I yeah, it's a bit of a I'm be honest, it's a bit of a plug. Um the right. the first book I wrote was uh, Crash Start, and that's um on about Guy Hudson. And Guy Hudson, I I'd said he died twenty sixth of June nineteen ninety five. And in his will, um he left a third of his estate, which amounted to um half a million pounds, to the Chancellor Masters and Scholars of the University of Oxford. And that was to fund the further education of officers of the Navy or the Royal Marines at the university. And I was one of the beneficiaries of that. I, I was a Hudson Fellow at Oxford for a year. And there's been 37 Hudson Fellows so far. And in addition, um, that his legacy pays for a lot of additional training for members of the University Royal Navy units up there, the midshipmen. Um, and the charity that it goes to is the Guy Hudson Memorial Trust, which pays for that. Um, it pays for education, they've lost as early students. And interestingly, even the United States Navy have taken the name of the Hudson Fellowship. They actually pay themselves for their own fellow to go. But the Hudson Fellowship's now got a lot of credence. And the research which is coming out of it, interestingly, um, one of the Hudson Fellow this year, one of her topics is mental health, which I think is really apposite, bearing in mind that Hudson um, almost certainly had PTSD as a result of his service. Um, the second biography was for Jake Wright, um, and his uh, his royalties go to the Coastal Forces Heritage Trust, which was founded in 1994 for the advancement of education of the public on the history of coastal forces. My favourite subject, what I've been talking about here. Um, they've established a thing called the Night Hunters Exhibition uh, at the Explosion Museum in Gosport. So big plug for the Explosion Museum in Gosport. Um, you've got a complete Coastal Forces exhibition there. And the money which comes from um, from torpedoes, tea and medals goes back to the Coastal Forces Heritage Trust for further projects to basically you know, enhance the memory and enhance the uh, remembrance and also to enhance knowledge of coastal forces, both from the First and Second World Wars. And also now we've got a Coastal Forces squadron even now um, serving in the Royal Navy. And it's all about them. So, yeah, Chris. This has been this has been really really good. It's definitely a rabbit hole. I'm going to be spending more time in as soon as I finish up some of the other stuff I'm doing. But do you want to um, remind everyone the titles of your books and uh, where they can get them? Certainly. Um, the title of my first book, Crash Start, which is the life and legacy of uh, of um, Guy Hudson, and the second one is Torpedoes, Tea and Medals, which is the gallant life of Commander Jake Wright. Um, they're available from all good bookstores. Uh, available online bookstores that. They're basically globally available. I, I hope you're going to add them to your bookstore as well so that you can take the 10% uh, the cut, which I think is absolutely brilliant because the work you're doing on the podcast is fantastic. But please do buy them. All the money goes to charity. I'm salaried. I don't need the money. I just enjoy doing what I do and researching. So please buy as many of the books as you can. It's just after Christmas. So buy them for next Christmas as presents for your mates. And uh, yeah, uh, available on all good bookstores. And, and also if they if they get them from our book our, our bookstore uh you the the author would get more money so the charities get more money so that's that's an even better reason to get them from us yeah definitely I say i get nothing all the all the author's royalties are assigned permanently to charity so uh, i get nothing out of any of this 
yeah, so definitely go out and buy them. I know I'm, I'm going to as soon as my next paycheck comes in. <laughs> Thanks very much, Chris. Our incredible guests give us 45 minutes of their time to join us and talk about their work or their new book. This is just a small taster. As a result, we have launched our very own bookshop on bookshop.org, where you can find our guests' latest books, you can support them, and you can support us on History Hack. 10% of every sale via our bookshop supports the podcast and allows us to keep going and bring you more top-of-the-line guests. You can find our bookshop at bookshop.org forward slash shop forward slash history hack or search for us in the shop section. Thank you so much for your continued support. We really appreciate our listeners and supporters. So make sure you get down to the bookshop and grab yourselves a new book.